Hello, chess fans. Welcome to another edition of Chess Chat, a program designed to give you, the viewer, a better understanding and an appreciation of the wonderful world of chess. I am your host, George Marijanian, Program Director of the Watch Who's a Chess Club. This club meets every Wednesday evening from 7 to 11 in room C199 of the McKay Campus School at Fitchburg State College. And with me is once again my trusty co-host, Martin Lane, current champion of the Watch Who's a Chess Club and one of the most active chess players in North Central Massachusetts. Welcome, Marty. Hey, George. Marty, yeah. today we're going to focus our attention on the first great Russian chess player, uh, who, who they say was the founder of the Russian chess school, which evolved into the Soviet school of chess. But he actually, he did more to popularize chess in Russia than anyone else. And we actually have some photos of him, early photos of, of uh, Mikhail Chigorin, Mikhail Ivanovich Chigorin. He was born in 1850. He died 100 years ago, 1908. Uh, and uh, he was a world championship contender. He challenged the first official world champion, uh, Wilhelm Steinitz. We have a picture of uh, Steinitz. Uh, this is a game we're going to present his game against Steinitz in a rematch. They played two world championship matches in Havana, Cuba, one in 1889, and this game we're going to present today is from the rematch from 1892. Now, George, when you say he founded the Russian School of Chess, we're not talking about an institution. There no. wasn't a building that this wasn't the Russian Chess Institute. What, what does that refer to, the Russian School That of refers chess? actually uh, actually the, th the theory. The, the, actually, there are movements in chess as far as uh, theories as far as how you play the game. Do you play aggressively? Is there, there's a school of thought that you should play aggressively. Then there's a school, for example, like the Russian school of chess, believed in mobility. That is, it was okay you know, to give up material if you could actually mobilize your forces in such a way that a pawn weakness is not a pawn weakness if you've got compensation in the way of, of, of very active pieces. Okay, now Steinitz, the, his opponent in the game that we're going to talk about, is known as the founder of modern chess, or the father of modern chess. How, how does his philosophy differ from Chagorin's? Well, he believed in positional chess. His game actually were, were, was not a game of tactics. Chagorin believed in tactical play, you know, attacking games, you know, gambits. Uh, Steinitz did not b believe in gambits. In fact, he actually poo-pooed, he belittled gambits. He says, you know, if you want to uh, refute a gambit, you've got to accept it. Or as actually the actual quote was something like, you know, the refutation of a gambit frequently lies in its acceptance. And he was a great believer, hey, if your opponent is going to offer you something, the way to refute it is take it. Uh, but Chigorin actually was one of the foremost, Chigorin was one of the most foremost tactical attacking players of the 19th century. Okay, so how did Chigorin come to learn to play chess? Well, actually he, he learned late in life. He was only 16 years old. We actually have a photo of, of a plaque, a memorial plaque uh, on the building in Gatchina, Rus Russia. He, this is not too far from St. Petersburg uh, uh, where he went to school, he was an orphan. His, his parents died when he was very young, about nine or 10. He went to the school from the age of nine until he was 18. And two years before he graduated from the school, he actually learned chess, 16. But he really didn't take up the game seriously until he was around 23. So there was a gap between learning the game at 16 and then really becoming involved in playing in tournaments. In fact, he, he got a, a government job. After he graduated from the school, in Gatchina, Russia, he became a, a, a clerk for the, for the government, a gov you know, a, a federal clerk, and he gave up that. He, he soon gave up that, that clerk's job and, and took up chess full time. And he, as I say, popularized the game. You know, back then, Russia, uh, chess was not popular in Russia. There were very few chess clubs. What he did, what Chagorin did, was give simultaneous exhibitions. He'd go around to different communities and play players, you know, uh, at the same time in an exhibition. He would also give lectures. He was an editor of several chess magazines. Uh, he was also wrote uh, columns for newspaper, uh, newspaper chess columns. So he was really the first 
I guess you would call him first professional chess player in Russia. Okay, so he, he gradually built up his reputation as a, as a world-class player. Steinitz had already been world champion. He was the first recognized world champion. Yes. And there were a number of, of really top players at that time. And there, there came a time in the 1890s when they were looking for a challenger yes. to, to Steinitz. And there was actually some discussion about who, who would make a good challenger. How did, how did, how did Steinitz settle on Chigorin? That is because Chigorin proved that he could defeat. He actually had an excellent record against Steinitz in tournaments. In tournaments to play. So Steinitz, uh, back then Steinitz, you could, you could actually pick your, your, your challenger. Right. And he picked, he says, okay, he got very annoyed that actually Chigorin was beating him in tournaments. So to prove that he was better than Chigorin, he says, I'll play Chigorin for the world championship. And he was convinced that he would win. And he did win. He actually won the match in 1889. And on the rematch in 1892, he, he, was, he was able to win both. But he wanted to dispel the, uh, you know, the notion that uh, he, was, uh, he, he was a weak player. Steinitz actually was light years ahead of everybody else as far as uh, his style of play, positional play. Bobby Fischer was very influenced by Steinitz. That is, uh, he, he ranked Steinitz as one of the top ten players of all time. Uh, Chergorin was not on Bobby Fischer's top ten list. But Steinitz definitely was. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a word about how a match differs from a tournament play. In, in tournament play, you, you play an opponent once. Right. And then you play, all, of course, the other players in the tournament. Um, but in a match, you're playing the same player game after game. So yes. how, does, how does that change your, your strategy? Well, first of all, in a match, you can naturally you can prepare against right. an opponent. You can actually review those games that the opponent has played and try to find weaknesses, trying to find loopholes weak in, the, in the opponent's play. In tournaments, now it depends. If it's a round-robin tournament where you know the, to the, the players you're going to be facing, you can also prepare. But normally in tournaments played in this country, as you well know, Martin, right. as you've played in many, many of them, you have no idea who you are playing from round, round to round. round. Right. So there's no way to prepare and, and do research on the games of your opponents. Right. So match play in, requires really intensive you know, study, research right. uh, of your opponent. Now, I yeah. think we should get into the game sure. because this is actually a, a game longer than usual that we present. Right. But this was from 1892. It was game one of the World Championship rematch right. played in Havana, yeah. Cuba. And Chigorin had white, and he opened the game with E2, E4. E4, right. Okay, an excellent move, king pawn opening, uh, always very popular back in the, the 19th century. And still popular. Still popular. So Steinitz responded with the pawn on e7, plays e5. Okay. It's all right. So he actually, uh, it's, this is what we call a double king pawn, right. again. And Chagorn uh, develops his king knight to f3, uh, develops, develops the knight, it attacks black's pawn on e5. Okay, so it's the first threat of the game, right? the attack on this pawn. All right, so what the Steinitz did, he just defended that pawn by developing a piece. He plays knight on b8, he plays knight c6. Right. All right. And now Chagorin answers by developing his bishop. He plays his bishop to c4. Now why uh, there? Is well, it's an, it's, a, it's an important diagonal. It attacks the f7 pawn on black side, which is, is a pawn that's defended only by the king. So it's really the weakest and most vulnerable pawn on the board. So he develops the bishop attacking this pawn. Uh, he also prepares to castle on the king's side. It's a developing move. Um, All right. That makes sense. Now, there are, th there are players who would develop, you could also develop the bishop to b5. Right. That, that changes things a little bit because it, it, in fact, threatens to win the pawn by exchanging the knight for the bishop. All right. Uh, so what uh, Steinitz re replied here on his on his move here is he played bishop c5, right. so and he's doing it he's doing it for, he's doing for the for same one reason. Is to the other, right. He's developing a piece, but also aiming at, that is putting pressure on this pawn, this f f2 f2 pawn, which again, which right. is the weak, the most vulnerable spot in, in White's camp here. All right, so now it's uh, Shigorin's move, his uh, his fourth move Ooh. coming up. Now there are a number of choices. Um, one of the most popular ones is to play c3, which prepares an eventual d4. Attacking the bishop, attacking the pawn. Attacking the bishop, that's a very common move. What else um, is possible? 
can play d6, just simply opening up a diagonal for the for the other bishop, uh, protecting this pawn, you know, and building a very solid position. White could castle. That would also that can, that can also be done. All of those lead to very quiet games, mm -hmm. very slow developing, very steady games. Uh, what Chagorin chooses to do, talking about how he goes for tactics, we talked about his his philosophy earlier. He strikes right at the bishop by playing b4. He offers a gambit. He, Ah, so he's offering this pawn, this B pawn. Uh, so now it's a question, now again, he's playing Steinitz, and of course Steinitz is a great believer that if, if a gambit is offered, you take it. And what he did, he could actually there are two ways to take this pawn. He could have taken knight takes B4, but he took the most logical, or the more logical move was bishop takes B4. Right. So now he's won a pawn, he's accepted the gambit. Right. All right, so now how does uh, Chigorin continue now? It's, well, uh, the, the, the purpose of the gambit is, is to, to be moving that bishop around, get it off the important diagonal, and he's going he's gonna to kick the, the bishop away by playing C, the pawn to c3, threatening that bishop. All right. Now the bishop has to go someplace else. He has right. to move the bishop again. Right. And this is what we call in chess gaining, gaining a tempo, get his gaining time. So now this bishop now, there are only three logical answers to this attack on the bishop. The bishop actually go back to where it came from on c5, that's a possibility. Or it could actually go back to e7, which is more passive. It, 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 it's, a, it's a playable move because it, the bishop is now able to operate on both sides, both flanks of the board. But what uh, Steinitz played was bishop a5, still maintaining this pressure along this diagonal. Right. All right, so now it's uh, uh, Chigorin's move. And Chigorin chooses to castle. There's kind of a distant pin on this pawn. If he plays d4 right away, which is what he would like to do, this pawn doesn't really, in fact, protect the d4 pawn because it's pinned against the king. So he castles first, gets his king into a safe position, centralizes his rook. Okay. All right, so now uh, uh, Steinitz now, on his uh, sixth move, plays d6, opening up the diagonal for this light-squared bishop to come out. Right. All right, so now it's Chigorin's move. And now move. Chigorin plays the move he's wanted to play, and that's the pawn to d4. This pawn is no longer pinned. It's protected by the knight, um, and he's, he's going for the center. And he control, actually controls control the center. The center right. So by giving up this pawn, he's actually gained time. He takes control of the center. So. Is this compensation? Is it's too early to tell? Too early to tell. Too right? early to tell. All right, so he plays d4. Well, what Steinitz plays here on his seventh move is bishop g4. Pins the knight, develops a piece, which is, all, which is very important in chess in the opening. Getting those pieces out into the game as fast as possible. All right, so now it's uh, Chigorin's move. Well, and this, this becomes a, a kind of a critical time. Um, he needs to decide what he's going to do. Does he want to develop another piece? He could play the queen to b3, which he did in a later game. And he mm -hmm. also can play the queen to a4, which he did in a later game in this same match. They, they explored this position several times in the course of this match. All right. Um, but yep. what he did in this game was he played bishop to bishop five, pinning the knight against oh, the So king. he's pinning this knight. Right. And, and the also... Threat, the threat is playing d5, winning the... Winning the piece, yes. Uh, all right, so now this is a uh, interesting uh, threat here. What uh, Steinitz did here after this pin, bishop b5, he played e takes d4 first. e takes d4. Okay. All right, so and now Chigorin... Chigorin recaptures. He can't recapture with the knight because the knight is pinned against the queen. Okay. Now we see white's threat is renewed by play, advancing this pawn on d5. Right. So what uh, Steinitz does here, he wants to break this pin. This is very dangerous to allow this d5 with this pin here. So he plays bishop back, bishop to d7. Right. So he breaks this, right. Uh, right. this pin here on the knight. So Chikorin chooses to develop this bishop onto an important diagonal. The bishop goes to b2. Uh, this is a central diagonal, and it, it's important to control it. It runs right through the center of the board. Okay. All right, so what Steinitz did here, now Steinitz in this position could have developed another, a new piece here like this knight. This knight could actually have gone maybe to e7, knight g e7, or knight f6. All of these are possible moves. What in he, fact, did, he did. He did that in later games. He did in actually, the same in, match. in the yeah. same match, he did play that. So he actually he did he, he improved he on improved in, yeah. what he did in this first game of the of the rematch is he played knight c, on c the c knight knight c e7 so he goes back here 
and now he uh, re releases an attack on this bishop sure. on b5. All right, so w what does uh, Chigorin do here? After well, Knight Chigorin C? could think about repositioning the bishop if he wanted to. He could try defending it uh, with his knight. He could try defending it with his queen. But what he chooses to do is to exchange it. He plays bishop take d7 check. Okay. And Steinitz is not going to take back with the king because if you take back with the king, you forfeited castling, you've, and you've put your king in the center, which is a very dangerous place to, to have it. So he's forced to take back. Queen takes d7. That's his move. That's his 11th move. All right, so it's uh, Chigorin's move coming up. Okay, now Chigorin is looking for, he, he wants to develop this knight. Um, normally, you would, you would think about developing to d2 or to c3. Toward or, the center. Toward the center, though those are preferred squares. What he does is he plays the knight to a3, which is not usually recommended unless you've got a reason, and he's looking at the c4 square as a, as a future home for this knight. So temporarily, it's okay, but that's not okay. usually where you want to go. But that's a, that's a very good, I, a good plan, to coming yeah. here and gaining a tempo, attacking right. the bishop. As long as he's got a reason. He has okay. to have a reason. Right. Okay. So what uh, uh, Steinitz did here, well, he's, I don't know what his, his, his rationale was back then. He's looking at you know, the knight going here. He knows the knight's going to go block the bishop here. So what he does, he plays his knight on g8 and plays this knight. Instead of playing it to f6, he plays knight h6. So he says, okay, if you can put your knight on, on the rim, I can put my knight on the rim. But if you compare the two, that's yeah. much less effective well, yes. than this one. There's, right. there's no future for that knight. All right, so how does uh, Chigorin well, continue here? This is what his plan was, to go take the knight and go to c4, attacking the bishop on a5. Okay, that bishop has to be saved. Something has to be done. Okay, right. now uh, he has he either has to defend it. If he were to defend it with b6, this knight could actually take, take this it. and double these pawns, right. which are a weakness. So what he does instead is to play bishop b6. So he said, okay, I'll go back. Bishop b6 is his 13th move. Okay. All right. So Chigorin's well, move coming up. So he, he could if he wanted to. He could exchange now if he wanted to. But he can also mount a threat. He plays the a2 pawn to a4, threatening to advance to a5 and winning the bishop. That's right. This, if, he ever, he, if he ever accomplished this, that bishop would be lost. All right. So what uh, Steinitz plays after a4, he tries to find a little hiding place for the bishop. Well, he plays c6. Now, he could have actually, in this position, just left it. No, he can't leave it there. No. If he had played this, like, up here, a6, to c create this escape square for the bishop here, this knight actually could have taken this, b right. this taken. bishop. He takes back with the c pawn and gives black an isolated, isolated pawn. d pawn, which is not good. Right. So what he does instead is he plays c6. Right. Okay. He figures, okay, I, I, maybe if he doesn't take me now, I can scoot out. And, say, and save myself. All right, so what does uh, uh, Chigorin do now? Well, one of the things you want to do, you, you, if you look at the position, he's got, he's got a lot of control in the center. He controls an important diagonal. He's got his knights aggressively posted. He's got a queen on the central. He's castled. Yes. His uh, black's king is not castled. It's a good time to think of a way to attack, and he chooses to attack by advancing his e pawn to e5, attacking okay. that backward pawn. Okay. Now, here is where... Chigorin made a very critical decision here. I mean, I should say Steinitz. What he did, instead of taking this pawn, he could have taken this pawn, D takes E5, but he chose to play D5, attacking the knight. All right, right, so what does Chigorin do after that? Well, now we, we mentioned that black hasn't castled yet, so the king is still in the middle of the board, and Chigorin is going to take advantage of this by playing knight to D6, check. Aha. Uh -huh. King has to move. Has Any to time move. a knight checks the king, and you can't take it. You can't take it. You can't take it. The king always right. has to move. There's no blocking on a knight check. So the king now is not going to move over to d8 and stay in the center. Okay. It's going to move to f8. King f8 is uh, Steinitz's move. All right. So now what does Chigorin do? Chigorin is going to increase the pressure. He's going to take this bishop and play from b2, the bishop to a3, putting it on the same diagonal as the king. As the king. Oh, this is a very nice diagonal to be on. All right. So what uh, Steinitz does, he plays, I said, okay, I'll get off this diagonal, and he goes king g8. Now you see how how, how p pitiful this is? Right. He's actually he's shut, he's, he's blocked, shut. locked in his ro this rook on h8. Right. But he, he uh, chooses to do that to uh, save, uh, save face. Right. All right, so now what's happening? So Shigorin's going to continue to uh, increase the pressure. He's going to move this rook to b1. Yes. Which, is there a threat? Well, the distance threat is if, if he moves his bishop anywhere, if he tempts the bishop off, 
then the rook can come down check it, attacking the, the queen. queen. Oh, oh yeah, the, a rook on the seventh, as they say, is, is always good. Yes, yeah. you can put ro a rook, and especially two rook. You can get two right. rooks, you know. But here, yeah. So there's a threat of advancing, attacking the bishop, deflecting the bishop, and then allowing the rook to take down, uh, to take this pawn on b7, attack the queen. All right. So and now, then the bishop is here and takes the knight. All right. You know, so. so now Steinitz plays knight h. See, two going to f5. He goes knight h f5. Right. So uh, it's uh, Chigorin's move here. And what he's look, what Steinitz is looking to do is to when you're under pressure, you're trying to simplify, meaning you go for exchanges, you try to get pieces yep. off the board. All right. Um, Chigorin comes up with a, a really surprising and effective move. He sac he takes knight take pawn on f7. Big surprise. Big surprise. Okay. And. The, he is forced, Steinitz is forced to take this knight because if he, does, he declines to take that knight, this knight on the next move is going to win this rook, which right. is more valuable right. than the knight. Right. It's called winning the exchange. That's Anytime, a, the penalty for locking it in. Exactly. It All in. right, so he has to take it, otherwise right. he loses, uh, you know, materially. So he takes, king takes f7. All right, so now it's just Shigorin's move. And now Shigorin forks a knight in the queen by pushing the pawn check. Checking the king, threatening the queen. Again, something has to be done. Now, can, can he take with the queen? If, can he, he, if, he, if does, he took with a, the queen? There's another fork, knight to g5. And he will win the, the, he he wins the, the queen, queen on so the next move. So he, so can't, he can't take, take with the queen. Point, right. So he's forced to take, king takes e6, it's forced. There's no way around that. All right, so now it's uh, uh, white's move here. Right. Now, he, he could, the check here now wouldn't be effective. He can just go for cover. So what he does is he attacks the queen. He plays knight to e5, attacking the queen. Now the queen has to go somewhere. Okay, all right. Away from the king. All right, so what uh, Steinitz does here, he has to figure out where it's a safe square for his queen, and he chooses to play the queen to c8. Queen c8 is his move on the 21st move. And now Shigorin moves his rook to e1, threatening a discovery. Um, oh, when this knight, if when the knight, knight moves, moves, the king will be in check. Knight. Uh, okay, yeah. so, he ha so he has to get off this line of fire. Right. So the only move he can do, he can't go to any of these squares because they're covered by the knight. And this square is also covered by the bishop. He plays king f6. Okay, so king f6. So now he's, he brings the queen out to h5. Threatening, what's threatening queen to f7 check would be one thing. In fact, mate, wait, 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 actually, wait. This, this is, is this a mate right here? That's not quite mate, because the king still has there. Oh, that's right, but, yes. Oh, but actually, there's another this, mate. This is mate. So that is mate. Right. So it's knight g4. Mate, so. so the mate is with a knight. Right. Yeah, all right. So this is not too good. So after queen h5, he has to start, he has to give himself escape squares. So he plays g6, attacks the queen. Queen. All right, so now what does he do? Well, Shigori, showing the effectiveness of, of how his pieces are placed, he plays bishop take, he has all sorts of resources, he plays bishop take e7, All right. Check. Okay, so he has to take back, and what he chose to do, uh, he took back with the king to maintain, he's still maintaining the attack on the queen, so he mm. takes, king takes e7. And probably with the idea of maybe he can get away over on this other side. Right. But okay. Shigorin's got plenty that he can do. What happened? He plays knight take the pawn on g6, and it's a double check, once from the knight and once from the rook. Ooh, so the king has, has to, move to move here. So where is this, well, the king uh, doesn't have too many squares to go to, but this is one of them, king f6, all right? So now white takes the rook on h8. All right, okay, uh, and of course he's threatening to scoot out again, or actually even th threatening check. Thre yeah. He's threatening check with the queen. Right. Yeah, right. This is the, the so what he so to stop this check for the queen, this queen and goes to, to d7, d7 to stop this queen right. from checking on f7. So right. Shigorin takes advantage of the lull and and plays his rook to bishop three, preparing to slide it over to add it to the attack. Okay, so rook b3 with this idea of what we call a rook lift. Right. When you bring a rook from the back rank up, up, and then the threat is to bring it over and pin that knight. Okay, so after rook b3. What happens here? He has to, uh, well, let's see. Well, he took here. Bishop takes d4. Right. All right. Hoping to relieve some of the pressure. Pressure, right. So now, so now he pins. Oh, so this is, this is not too good. Well, uh, Steinitz feels, OK, I've got everything defended. The queen and the king are defending here, even with the pin. So he says, oh, it's time to take this knight, get right. rid of this knight. So he takes rook takes h8, all right. Now Shigorin attacks the knight with the pawn, g4. Mm-hmm. So now this is, okay, so he's threatening now on the next move to take rook takes, you know, uh, f5 check. All right, so what does uh, uh, Steinitz do? Well, he says, okay, you're pinning me, 
but I can play rook g8 and pin you. Right. This stops the pawn from taking there. Right. Oh, yeah. All right, so what happened here? After well, he could, uh, he, could relieve, he could relieve that pin just by moving the king, but he's got much better. He's got something better. Right. He okay. Could, he, could, um, he, play, he could play. The knight is still pinned against the king. He can play rook to g a uh, queen, sorry, to h6. Check. Check. Okay. So now uh, it would not be good to move the... If he moves the king, he's taking a defender off this knight, and the rook, rook. would be free. In fact, it would be, it would be like mate. Close to or close to me, would cost him the queen. Right. So what he does is he blocks. He plays rook g6, attacks the queen, uh, and forces now uh, Chagorin to do what? Well, Chagorin has rook take knight check. So rook takes f5 check, check, and in this position, Steinitz He's resigned. Denied. Why? Why would he resign? Can, can, he, can he simply take queen takes f5 like this? He didn't do it. He must have he, saw something well, because not, on queen takes f5. There, there's really no other choice except rook to, I mean, yeah. the queen, that's it. That's the only move that's he can do. Move had because but, that can be followed up by queen to f8, check. Check. The king only has one square to go to, which is king g5. And now how does white continue? White can continue, queen take queen. Check. Queen takes f5, check. check. And he can't go to king h4. Why not? Because it would be mate, mate. that way. All right, so if he can't go to h4, could he go to h6? What happens on that? He could go to here. All right. Queen h5, check. check. Forcing the king to g7. Okay, now how does white continue this attack? Well, it comes down with the rook. All right, so now the king has to move. Let's say the king moves over here to attack the rook. Now how we continue? Uh, queen can defend the rook by taking the pawn on h7. Okay, and now the threat. Mate. Now the threat and mate. Now is, is there a way to stop this mate? Well, he can block it with the rook. Or, the, or the, in the, fact, I think he's forced to do that. That's, there's no the other choice. The only move he can do is to take it like that. Yeah. And, 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 and white simply takes it and be queen against the Oh yeah, the, the and after bishop. the recapture, there's, this there's, queen there's, versus the bishop push, of the pawn, these pawns are going nowhere because the queen right. will stop it. Right. So what uh, uh, Steinitz did after the rook takes f5 uh, check was resign the game. So again, this was the first game of, the, of, the, of that rematch. Uh, and actually, Chigorin actually, uh, well, I think he won the second game, or maybe it was a draw. But he lost the match. You know, he, he had a brilliant start, but he wasn't able to... Uh, 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 he did more against Steinitz defeating. He had a plus record against Steinitz in tournament play, right. but in match play, he just didn't have the wherewithal to defeat him to become world champion. Uh, so, as far as Chigorin, you know, there are a lot of. Uh, oh, he, uh, Chigorin was also known as a theory, chess theoretician. There were openings and defenses and variations which he contributed to chess yeah, theory. Still carry his name. Still carry his name. Just like the Evans Gambit. Now, we, what we played was the Evans Gambit. We have it on the board here. Right. Characteristic move is B4. Uh, it was actually na it was, it was the brainchild of a Welsh sea captain who they claim uh, in 1824 came up with this move, this gambit, and it's, it's caught on. And if, in every country of, 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 of the planet where chess is played, everybody knows the name Evans Gambit. It's well known. So, but again, no one plays it nowadays. Although, world champion, former world champion Gary Kasparov has played it. Right. Uh, you've had actually a, a, a Dutch grandmaster by the name of Jan Timman play it. Yeah. English grandmaster John Nunn. But nowadays, you don't see it actually in grandmaster chess. It, it has largely surprise value. I mean, somebody who, who's prepared can, right. can usually beat it. Okay, so anyways, uh, this is at the first time we've presented at Evans Gambit, and they're always exciting. Right. What Chigorin did, again, he played the, the Evans Gambit frequently, but then he eventually gave it up and went switched over to the King's Gambit. So anyways, I, I hope you viewers enjoyed the, the game that uh, Martin and I presented uh, today. We're going to present uh, an interesting program next time because we're going to focus on the New England Open Championship, which is being played Labor Day weekend at the Holiday Inn of Boxborough. So we're going to have some interesting things to say about that tournament, have some photos of local players who are competing in that New England Open. And I hope you join us for the next edition of Chess Chat.